<laughs> this is Neville Gallimore from the Dallas Cowboys, and I want to give a major shout out to Mike Tag. Keep bringing the hype to the Cowboys Nation. We love and appreciate it. Now, can you dig it? Let's get it. What is up? Welcome to another edition of Tag Nation. This is a special, special edition of Tag Nation because we are getting started in the off season. We've got a lot of things going on, so this gives us time to reflect, understand history, and learn a little bit more. And if you guys seen me, we recently had an interview with the Super Bowl champion of the Buccaneers. We played with the Cowboys, Brad Johnson. We had a lot of fun with that. Make sure if you didn't see that, go to the YouTube page, like, subscribe, because you don't want to miss any of it. We've got a lot of things going on with the channel with Jimmy D and with Kelly K9. We got we have a lot of fun. So, but I don't want to waste any time. We've got a special guest, and we're talking about a man who two-time Super Bowl champion, been to five Super Bowls. He never, he never had a losing season with the Dallas Cowboys. Three-time Pro Bowler, two-time All Pro. He is just you know one of the legends of America's team, and that is Mr. Charlie Waters, we got him on the phone. How you doing today, sir? Good morning, Mike. I'm, I'm doing fine. I'm doing, still kind of upright, you know. <laughs> that's never that's Thanks. never a bad thing. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, Considering the alternative. Oh, absolutely, no doubt about it. But uh, just wanted to jump in. Appreciate you, you know, being able to, to to enter the cave, as I like to always say. I'm a big Cowboys fan. I do a lot of stuff on on social media. Some some. Label me the hype man to try and motivate Cowboys fans, and it's a little hard. I mean, it's been 27 yeah. years, uh, and and <laughs> a lot of people don't know the spoils. I didn't. Now I'm a, I was born in '75, so I'm going to be honest. I didn't see your career, but I'm a historian of the game, and I love the Cowboys. And those years that you were that you were playing, and we're going to get into it. But I mean, Cowboy fans don't understand how good they had it back in the day. Yeah, it, we had a. You know, we kind of take took, took for granted that we were going to make the Super Bowl every year, uh, and it started in 1970. And uh, which we we played really, you know, a lot of great teams. We had great record. Coach Tom Landry was the number one reason for it. I mean, he was such a brilliant young uh, coach at the time. And the other thing is different about the Cowboys, or at least I'd give accolades to, is, that, is them being able to find people like me, and uh, on, you know, quarterback in college, certain wide receiver, and he calls me the day of the draft and says, hey, we want to find out if you can run backwards or not, <laughs> and he, I told him I could, <laughs> um, but the innovation the, and the, the creative concept that Gil Brandt brought to the table about putting Cornell Green, a basketball player, on the field as a strong side, a strong safety. And people like that. And, you know, Gamble. Gamble on Cliff Harris. He took the kid, Cliff was a free agent, and Cliff um, started his rookie year, and he got his, <laughs> his National Guard unit got called to active duty, so I had to take his place uh, in 1970. So, yeah, uh, those are the kind of things that we had. We had people that were that Gil Brandt saw something in, or the coaching staff saw something in, and and then they they rode with rode with it. You know, that was the concept. Yeah, and and you guys, I mean, just a special special team. And and it was interesting in the in the sixties. You know, during that time, you know, and then going into the seventy. Dallas always seemed to just come up short. And I, I think that they always said next year's champion. Yep. And I know it was evident in the Super Bowl in 70, losing that close game 
where, I mean, it was, you know, Chuck Halley gets a gets Super Bowl MVP and he was on the losing MVP. team. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, yeah. the, the image of, of uh, the great Bob Lilly just throwing his helmet out of frustration at the end of the game. Is that, you know, you were a rookie there, so you didn't have those earlier years, but did you sense in that team that, you know, enough's enough, next year is going to be our year, and then obviously the guys went on to, to win the Super Bowl and dominate the Miami Dolphins in in that Super Bowl. Yeah, well, the uh, the first one we went to was really frustrating for us. As, a, as you said, Bob Lilly, just, I'm, that's an iconic move. We just threw his helmet 50 yards down the field in just total disgust that we could not figure out a way to – at that time, they had gone to the uh, – had a real successful seasons coming into the, that Super Bowl, uh, but they couldn't get past the set first or second round. Mm-hmm. And then this one, we had a chance you know, we're in the Super Bowl, and I'll be dead done if we could not win that one. Uh, but it's a credit to the committee that to give uh, Chuck Alley that the award is the most valuable player on a losing Super Bowl team. That is just, it was just to let you know how strong our defense was. Yeah. And um, and, and so it, it was such a, I was 21 years old and uh, never made a tackle in my life. And they, when I played that, got it this season. And, I, and Cliff Harris was starting free safety that year. And his, um, National Guard unit got called to active duty, <laughs> which yeah. is the, whole, the, the yeah. reason why he was, the reason why he was in the National Guard because he was not going to be called to, to active duty, but he did, and and so I took his place. And he and he and I were um, really really good friends. Yeah, yeah, and I know you are obviously to this day, and you guys, you know, created probably one of the greatest safety tandems in NFL history and uh it, you know a lot of a lot of people don't appreciate it or don't know don't know the history but they need to look it up because I mean you had 41 career interceptions in the season you know nine in the playoffs and uh one of the games you know I wanted to ask about was that playoff game against Chicago we had three interceptions uh in that one game is would, is that kind of is that one of your signature games or something that probably is the most memorable to you looking back at your career? Yes, it it was. I mean, that the, the, that's a NFL record for the most interceptions in the uh, the national playoff, the National League playoff game was three. I'm tied with the, about two other guys, Ronnie Lott, and, and I can't remember who the other guy is right now, but. Yeah, I had, I had a real good game. We had a real good season, uh, but it was frustrating not to win. Yeah. Uh, and, and we never got complacent about, um, about lo- losing, you know, and making you know, considerations as well. This is the reason why we lost and we got to fix this. Well, Coach Landry went about it really, really strong. He, he complimented us for when we did things right, but we needed to. There was such a coordinated defensive scheme. You know, he ran the flex defense, and, mm-hmm. and it's a it's a strange concept to play where two defensive linemen on the line of scrimmage are about two and a half yards off the ball, and and there was they had to think too. I mean, with Coach Landry, when he would draw up the uh, game plan and get you know, give us instructions where we're supposed to go. He used to draw little feet on the chalkboard to tell the defensive lineman what foot to step with, uh, you know, to, to go to reach the, the, the point that he wanted to ha- wanted to happen on the side of the defense. And, and everybody used to think, golly, this is crazy. I don't want Randy White, you know, two yards off the ball. I want Randy White right on the line of scrimmage. Yeah. Or Bob Lilly, you know, I want Bob Lilly right on the line of scrimmage. But no, the defensive scheme, we all work together. It's, even the secondary, we had to study an awful lot to figure out what the, 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 our responsibility was going to be. 
uh, in the flesh sequence. So I can't credit Coach Flandria enough. He just was such a special coach. And, of course, Gene Stallings was my coach, and I really thought off a lot of him, too. He did yeah. a great job. Yeah, Gene Stallings was the coach at Alabama. I'm a Miami Hurricane fan. He broke my heart in the in the, uh, in, the in the national championship game uh, when we thought we were going to win, and Alabama came in and really really put it on us. But but you know, Coach Landry's just you know it, it, it's such an iconic figure. Obviously, statue in front of the stadium, and and, and a lot of the, this generation really don't understand how great he was. And, the, I think they had like 20, you guys, 22 consecutive winning seasons, you know, the five Super Bowl appearances, coached 27 years plus, or I, don't, I may, may be off on some of the years, but just he was the only coach I knew. And I remember as a kid when they made that change and, you know, and, and they, you know, uh, and they let Landry yeah. go. I wrote a letter. I remember a little kid, I wrote a letter to, to, uh, to the owner, Jerry, just so upset and mad and, and I know a lot of people in Dallas. It was just, it, it was like, uh, you know, losing, you know, losing your father. He was so impactful on so many careers. And I've talked to so many different former players and they all say the same. He had a tough, he kind of had that tough exterior, but he was probably one of the kindest, uh, compassionate uh, uh, people that, that you could ever know. Yeah. It's, uh, one, of the, one of the things he used to say an awful lot is, the more you know about offense, the better defensive player you're going to be. And, uh, of course, I was an offensive player my whole life until I got to the NFL. So I knew a little bit more about what the quarterbacks were thinking and wide receivers. But, uh, and that, that helped me, you know, make the team my rookie year. And, mm -hmm. But Coach Landry was just, he was an iconic figure. He's just such a, he's a strong Christian man. Uh, I don't think I ever heard him say a cuss word the whole time we played the NFL, which I'm telling you, that's pretty <laughs> strong. Pretty rare. <laughs> <laughs> pretty rare, yeah. Uh, but I, you know, but it's a, it was a team uh, effort on on the way we got players, and, and that's where Gil Brandt came in. And, uh, uh he just knew so much about it. and gamble, gamble on Cliff Harris and gamble on me and gamble on Drew Pearson, mm -hmm. you know, people like that that, that were not. Um, it's true. You know, these not, guys in the Hall of Famer. I mean, you're picking up Hall of Famers yeah. as, as free agents. There was a. Um, yeah. Free was agents. A, go ahead. We've got plenty of them. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it, it and they had that system. And Gil Brandt, I mean, obviously got in the Hall of Fame, and and it just was an innovator and ahead of his time. You know, there was a there was a player. I I'm sure you know who he is, but he wasn't a big cowboy. He had one catch, and that one catch was in the Super Bowl um, uh, against Pittsburgh. It was his name was Percy Howard, and yes. I saw a story about him. And he grew up in South Florida, and I grew up down there, and he went to Dillard High School, and that was kind of a rival school of mine when we were growing up. So it's funny. I reached out to him just to kind of, you know, take a shot. I just love those stories. And we sat and talked for, for about an hour or two at a diner and just sharing stories. But he was another one of those guys where he was a basketball player, but he had amazing speed. And Gil Brandt, you know, they they they, they – offered him an opportunity to be a free agent with the Cowboys. And he, he, he was a, you know, a fast receiver. Unfortunately, he had some injuries, you know, he, he got hurt and, and his career never blossomed to probably what, what it could have been, but it's just another story of finding guys outside the norm that never, he said he never really even played football. He's more of a basketball guy. And it just shows the, 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 uh, the, the ability of Gil Brand and the staff to just to find these guys to your point, just to kind of cement it. It's amazing what the Cowboys were able to do in that era of getting talent. Yeah, it really was. It was strange. Uh, there's a lot of players, and another one comes to mind is Bob Hayes. Yes. Uh, he's an Olympic sprinter, and I don't even know if he played football. I don't know that for sure. Uh, but, my gosh, the guys, when I played quarterback and – Bob Page would come to my side of the field instead of facing him. I'd turn the other way and get ready to start running. <laughs> I knew he was going to close on me pretty quickly. And I, uh, 
Uh, I never got close. Never got that close to him. So <laughs> that's no, that's too funny. So, yeah, that's too funny. It's so funny. how you know the 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 rivalries that you had, you know, and again, you know, I was actually I, I was talking to uh, to Brad Johnson, who played with with Tampa, Super Bowl champion quarterback, and you know had a nice career and played in Dallas, and I was trying to pick his brain on the rivalry, and I guess you know it's kind of. It's died off the intense rivalry, but I remember a time where it was just hatred for the then Washington Redskins and the the Eagles and the Giants and the Cardinals were in our division. I mean, did you guys was that evident, you know, in the locker room, or was that a fan more? The fans have that passion more than the players, or did you guys really have that rivalry with these teams in the NFC East? Uh, well, yes, it, it's the it's. NFC East is, was the most competitive uh, division in, in the league during the times I was there. Uh, you know, Philadelphia didn't win, get to the playoffs very often, but boy, they were they were tough to play, boy, especially up on, on their stadium in their stadium in Philadelphia. But uh, that's that's and then of course Washington, boy, the fans were just rabid. <laughs> When we go up there playing one after after the game when we that we won, I, they, you know we used to play in a baseball field. Yeah, and we we had to go through the dugout to get to our locker room. So after the game was over, some fan uh, leaned over the top of the dugout. Thank God I had my helmet on and hit me over the head with a bottle. And <laughs> oh my god. And, yeah, yeah. I mean, let me tell you, that lets you know how rapid they were. Uh, and I think I got an interception right at the end of the game, and that's why he hit me. But uh, I, I looked around and saw Randy White, and he, he had witnessed the act, and he said, let's go. <laughs> and he climbed up on the dugout. <laughs> climbed yeah. up on the dugout and started pounding away on people for as much as he could. So, oh. um could you confirm yeah. that Randy White was uh, the the yeah. legend the, the legend of Randy White? He's a he's a man that you didn't want to kind of cross. Yeah, he. I nicknamed him the Monster, part man, part monster, and uh, he went by Monster his, his whole career. Oh, he owes you, know, you a lot. A lot of a lot of uh, money made on that name. <laughs> yeah. Well, along with Randy White, who's probably the I think the great one of the one of the greatest. I, I hate to say the greatest, but yeah. I, I never seen anybody any better football player than him. But when we're going along the line of Gil Brandt signing people, he went out there and signed uh, Tony Fritsch. Mm-hmm. And he went. To, I think he it was in. I think he was from Germany. I don't know. I, mean, I think that's where he was. He couldn't even speak English. He said. <laughs> I kick if he touched him. <laughs> <laughs> he could kick though. He could kick. He, oh, yeah. I held for I held for the kickers. And he used to get ask me all these things like, let me tell you a quick little story. Coach Landry was having a competition between kickers and and he he, he used to hold when he was uh, in the pros. Mm-hmm. And so he walked up to me and he said, Look, I want you to put the ball straight up and down. I don't want you to lean it any either way. I just want to know if everybody gets the same type of position of the ball it'd be a, a more fair competition i said okay coach and and uh, so the first guy kick gets up there and kicks and, and of course you know every time the guy kick, kicks he walks up to the to the point of where i'm going to put it down looks down sees where the point is and then goes back and is like two two and a half to three yards back and then they he would nod his head and then i would look to the center and the center would snap it mm-hmm. Tony Fritz walked up to the walked up to me when I was had my hand on the ground, let me know where I wanted to put it, and he says, "Lean it a little bit back, please, Charlie." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, "What am I supposed to do?" And here the kicker wants to lean back because Sanders telling me I want it, wants it straight up or down, but that just lets you know how the characters we had on our team they were very, very interesting, and then probably the biggest of all it was the rodeo cowboy walt garrison who used to rope i mean at least yeah wrestle steer wrestling 
you know. Yeah, he was a and real cowboy. Of, he was a real cowboy, and uh, and a very tough, one of the toughest guys I ever met. He cut his he cut his uh, finger. He used to whittle all the time, mm-hmm. and he was my, he was my roommate uh, on the road for about a couple years. And uh, so Walt was whittling in the in the hotel room the night before we played San Francisco. And uh, I'll be damned if he didn't cut his thumb. And it was looked to me like, now I'm probably exaggerating it because it just scared me to death. <laughs> and there's blood spurting out. And it looked like his thumb was just hanging there. Oh. <laughs> I had to call the team doctor. They came down there. They got in and took him out. And then they sewed, it, they sewed him up that night. And uh, the next year, the next day, he caught like, Five to seven, five or seven passes <laughs> had over a hundred yards rushing against the 49ers and never complained about his <laughs> wow. finger but, or thumb, but uh, characters. We had a lot of characters. Yeah, I mean, just it, it just so many, so many great ones. It's, 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 you know, you don't want to leave any of them out, but it was a special. I mean, it, you know, they always talk about the team of the 90s, and that's kind of like when I kind of grew up and, 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 you know, yeah, teenage that was years a great era. It, it, Cowboys. Great era, but a lot of people they don't they don't really understand the team of the seventies. They the Steelers got it because they, they they snagged a couple Super Bowls from us. But I mean Dallas going to five Super Bowls and at you know and and everything in the seventies. It was just such a dominant era for for the Cowboys. And some <laughs> something else that was interesting that 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 I read about you is you uh you had a knack for 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 blocking punts and you actually blocked four punts in i think two consecutive games no uh, that's correct and um i think i blocked six it might have been eight punts blocked eight punts in my career and there's a great statistic that goes along with that uh the team that blocks a punt usually wins about 90 to 95 percent of the of the of the games. Wow. So if you block a punt, then you've got a much better chance. You're losing field position and you're also getting the ball pretty close to the goal line or closer to the goal line. But um, that was a, I, 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 uh, I used to cheat a little bit. It's the way I cheated was I used to go out because I was a holder. Mm-hmm. I, I knew the, the rhythm of the, of the centers. So I'd go out to the center that, that snapped it back for the punt. So I used to go study before the kickoff. I'd go watch the guy that was snapping balls uh, for the for the kicker to do warm up drills. And I used to see as he, you know they all are, are a uh, sense of rhythm and consistency exactly the same. Yeah. So I got a great jump off the ball because I knew what the centers were going to be like because. Of course, I held for the field goal kicker, so uh, and that helped me. And you know, the other thing that helped me an awful lot on blocking punts is Thomas Henderson on the inside and Randy White on the inside and Larry Cole on the inside, and they and they definitely weren't going to let those guys through. So they kind of folded, closed in from the outside in, and then I came came from the outside and timed it and. And Gene Stallings was, I give, I give them a lot of credit. He was our uh, special teams coach that, that each each individual coach had, had one side of the kicking game. And so Gene's job was the punt return team. Mm-hmm. And he taught me how to block the punt, which when you go in there and you got a shot at it, don't try to time it with your hands trying to slap it down. Just put your hands straight out. And the, I mean, and you don't have to time it up. It's a lot better. And, and uh, you know what? That was a great little bit of uh, knowledge that I use when uh, when I block the punch. But as I said, I, I credit the guys as inside because they were the they were the great athletes. Yeah. And Thomas yeah. Anderson, I've never seen anybody as athletic as Thomas was. Okay. And uh, Randy, Randy White, what a man! Yeah. Answer. And really, the you know, it's a lost art, and and people don't 
understand or appreciate the difference, like to your point, a block and a punt, the percentage of winning. Everyone's with the offense. Everyone's with the defense. But special teams changes games, whether it be a big kickoff yeah. return, punt return, block punt, block kick. You know, and, and, and you know, the, for you to do it at that level and get that many, I mean, that's just another – you know, it's another area where this team was just unbelievable. And your career obviously was was phenomenal. One of the one of the guys that I was going to have I'm having on the on the show uh, soon is is uh, quarterback Craig Morton. And, you know, a lot of those early years and I talked to Larry Cole about it, too, in, in depth with with Stallback and, you know, you know, they were going, kind of going back and forth with Landry right. trying to figure out what quarterback. And and I know that Larry had said it was just one of those things where the players finally just kind of. You know, it's like, hey, coach, you got to you got to pick one. We love them both. But I mean, you've got to you know, we can't go. We need a leader. We need somebody, you know, to. we need one person to be the leader of the team. And obviously went with with Stallback and, and and the rest is history. But, you know, Craig Morton, you guys face him in, you know, in, in, in the Super Bowl. I think it was was it 12 Super Bowl 12 uh, versus the Broncos. And um, yeah. You know, a lot of turnovers, a lot of turnovers in that game. You guys made his life <laughs> miserable. And, you know, yeah. and that is your teammate. So is it like a brother where you want to really, you want to really, you know, hurt him? Or is it, man, you started, you, you feel bad because he's such a great guy and he was a teammate. And, you you know, is there a party that kind of felt bad during the game when it just was just uh, getting out of hand? Yeah, well, I never felt bad about winning. <laughs> of course you know? not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh but we we had we knew exactly what uh the timing in which Craig went about his game, the timing of setting up and the distance and on the plays that, that are quick set up as relative to a one that's a normal depth set up. Uh, and the blocking scheme that they used uh I got through there a couple of times and Got him, got him, sacked him, and, and one time I got him. I had the ball. I had, I had his jersey. I have a picture of it. But I had his jersey pulled down, and he threw the ball. And Randy, Randy Hughes, our our backup safety, got yeah. the interception. And uh, it was because we we you now we wouldn't have done that with Roger. If Roger was playing against us. He was. He would. He would figure out what was going on, and he'd move. Mm-hmm. See, Craig was not. He was he was stable. He was a pure pocket passer and had a beautiful throwing motion. And you and, and, and threw a nice ball. I mean, the ball was real comfortable to catch. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I didn't good for you guys to catch. You caught a bunch of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, that was in Super Bowl. We beat them in the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. That, I think we did. So in in in. This is always brought up, you know, with 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 players with multiple championships. I know it's been asked to like the triplets and stuff. It is are are you know your Super Bowl championships? Are they equal? Do you love them both? There's the first one always the best one. Oh gosh, I love them all the same. Actually, yeah. Um, I know that the the first one. I mean, I was the first two years in the league. Uh, you know, I told you Cliff Harris got called up, and I had to start. First, in the first Super Bowl, and the first two years in the league, we played in two Super Bowls, Small. which is <laughs> strange, so strange. I mean, it just it, that just didn't happen back then. You know, it was, it, there was parity in the league about the quality of teams and stuff like that. But uh, no, I, I I never took it for granted. I, I loved it that we had a. An aggressive defensive team, and and we had all the confidence in the world about Tom Landry and what he was uh, presenting to us on a weekly basis about how he, he used to mark write up three things on the on the chalkboard about which ones are the if we do one thing we're going to get this done. If you do this, you get this done. You're going to win the ball game. Yeah. And usually that was the case. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's why he was. That's why he was one of the greatest, greatest coaches of all time. And you know, just kind of finishing up a little bit uh, before I get to the current Cowboys. So when you retired, you 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 got into coaching, and um, you, you wanted to get into coaching. And 
I know you coached with with your former teammate Dan Reeves in Denver. And it, was there was there ever a thought or opportunity to to because I know a lot of the coaches kind of stayed in Dallas. Mike get, did good did it. Dan Reeves did it. Was there any any opportunity or it just didn't just didn't work out for you to coach in Dallas well, when your career uh, was over? You know, after everybody that coached with Tom, with Tom Landry, he would give you a psychological test to find out what kind of what's what's what going on with your personality and are you a team concept and all that. And I was this was at the end of my career um, when he he told me that that he wanted me to take a psychological test to find out what kind of person I am. I was going. Gracious, coach! I've been there for twelve years. <laughs> look for you, you know. But I mean, I had a little bit of a, uh, and I regret that. Yeah, I, I should have. Take, I should have just thought, played by the rules. I should have known that's what he was doing. And but I was that my ego kind of got in the way there. And then, of course, Dan Reeves. Um, he was the head coach at Denver at the time. He he hired me, and that I thought that was excellent. And I learned an awful lot for from every coach that I was around at Denver and every coach I played or coached with, I would learn something every day. Uh, so, yeah, I enjoyed it. I, I coached for seven years at Denver and I, and I coached one year at the University of Oregon, which I really loved mm-hmm. coaching college golf. Yeah. Uh, but my – I had a tragedy in my family. My oldest son died in his sleep, and I, I couldn't. I just could not see myself uh, working. I just, I just felt like I needed to be around my family yeah. a little bit more. And it, yeah, yeah, that's I. I'm really sorry to hear that, and that's totally understandable. And uh, yes. you know, but but you know, coaching with I, I always thought Dan Reeves. You know, again, he was kind of. I, I grew up, you know, in that era. Him coaching is probably one of the most uh, underrated uh, coaches. Um, you know, in he NFL also history. was un- underrated, uh, underrated running back too. He could, he'd throw halfback passes. And, oh yeah. He was a, he was a, he too was a quarterback in, in college. And uh, <laughs> he played, they used to run halfback passes. That was like the number, one of our main attacks on offense was, him throwing the ball on a on a sweep to the outside. Everybody comes up to get him, and there's somebody down the field. So, but Dan was a southern gentleman. He was he was from the, the state of South Carolina. And of course, he went to school at Carolina University of Carolina. I went to school at Clemson. Clemson, yeah. He never held, held it against me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Clemson, Clemson is uh, not the Clemson that, that I think during the years you played. They've turned into quite a powerhouse. Uh, they, in the, in the boy, last decade, you know, yeah, we, we didn't. We snuck into. Uh, we we had some success, but my gosh, Dabo Sweeney is doing such a great job down there. With a lot, so much better team than we team. So we were. Our team was very competitive to any team in the nation. Yeah, which that's incredible. That little old Clemson, they're yeah. not ruled anymore. And the you know they I'm a Miami guy they beat that they beat us like a drum every time it's like can we at least get competitive with them once but you know one of the one of the interesting things was I um I had the opportunity to go to the championship game when they played in Tampa versus Alabama and I just and I I got in because I was selling programs so if I sold programs and let you in the stadium it was like one of those you know one of those deals and the nicest fans I think I've ever seen. I haven't been to a game there, but everyone was just so friendly uh, that were Clemson fans. Every, uh, and they had the $2 bills, and I never understood the $2 bill, but everything was paid with a $2 bill, you know, with the Clemson logo stamped on it. That's how they bought all the programs. And then I read up, you know, the, the history of it and the reasoning behind it. So just, just I guess, great tradition at that school. So, uh Definitely respect that that university a lot. Yeah, well, um, Debo is a, is a great coach. I know the players believe in him and all. And my coach was Coach Frank Howard, and uh, he, he was he was a tough coach that 
and it's very strange. Uh, he'd come up with funny stories. He'd say, all right, we got us a new coaching. We got us a new blocking scheme for the offensive line. And he says, it's called cheer blocking. That you block cheer, you block cheer, and you block cheer. <laughs> and I was going, oh, my gosh, is this, this college football? <laughs> So that was a good little example of what Coach Howard was like. But yeah. That's... I wish I could have been around somebody like Debo. Debo's full of energy and very smart, very, very calculated on what 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 he's doing. There's there's a method to the madness there, and and there, it's showing it's proven off. Oh positive. yeah, absolutely. But, I just need to calm down a little bit. Let my Hurricanes at least to get a little taste of success in the, in the ACC. But, but yeah, it, it's, it's a lot of, I love college football too, I'm, I, but I have Cowboys my number one, but college football is, is a close second. So talking about today's Cowboys. So, you know, we talked about, you know, your beautiful, you know, great career. I mean, some could say, uh, you know, hall of fame career with the numbers you put up the championships and, and everything in Dallas. But I know there's always a little bias towards the Cowboys when it comes to that kind of stuff. I mean, we're, we're still waiting on on some other guys to uh, to get in, but looking at this cowboy team, it's been a long time. That's why I say it is. You're spoiled in the '70s. You guys are in the, in the playoffs every almost every year, and in the Super Bowl half half that decade. My son's 18. He doesn't know any success of, of Dallas to that level. Being a cowboy fan, I'm almost starting to feel bad for him. I look at him sometimes. I said, "Look, man, I told you you had to be a fan until you're 18. If you want to change, I mean, I I, I can hardly blame you, but." Uh, What's your, I mean, what do you think is, is just, is there anything that, that you could see that's just missing or is it just bad luck or is it, it just doesn't seem like they're able to, to get to that next, uh, next, next step. So there's so many variables that have to be uh, leaning in your favor to move forward in a playoff game or move to the next level in the playoff games. And, and it's a mix of a lot of different things. And some of it's psychological, some of it's physical. Um, sometimes it's a coaching style. And sometimes just it's just pure luck and faith. Uh, but I, I, I do follow them, and I get disappointed when they lose. But I'm not – I'm not in a position to figure out, uh, you know, what what they should be doing. Yeah. And if I got in there and studied everything that they how they do it and all that kind of stuff, uh, then then maybe I could. Yeah, let's go do this. Let's do this. But and, you know, yeah, and sometimes it's the media, right? You didn't have. I don't know if the media was yeah. big back then, so the media is constantly. Constantly. On the Cowboys, so I don't know if that does if that's a detriment to them. If it's because they're, I mean, they're not even in the Super Bowl, and they're still talked about. Uh, I mean, you go on ESPN and stuff; they're still talking about the Cowboys. Yeah. And what's wrong with the Cowboys and, and this and that? So I don't know if the outside noise is just so much that it, like you said, it can get psychological. If it's just you know it wears on you as a player. I, don't, I mean, I've never been played at that level, so I don't know if you're able to zone that out, but. With social media, with everything today, and all the eyes and everything, it's, it's got to be unbearable uh, as a, as a player. Uh, yes, I, I know it's disheartening. It is for it is for me. Of course, I don't. I'm not going to live and die by it. But those yeah. that, those guys that are playing out there, they, uh, you know, they like Michael Parsons. I mean, how great is he as a linebacker? Yeah, uh, he's special. And, and little, what's his name, the cornerback? Uh, Diggs. Diggs. Yeah, Diggs. 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 Yeah. Diggs. Yeah. Diggs. Yeah. He's a great player. Yeah, and so, they've got the pieces, right? They're not far. I mean, it's just like I tell people. It's like, far. don't. You're right. it, it, it's luck, right? It, like you, you said, a lot it, of it goes the right way. And, and Brad Johnson even says, like, he's like Mike. He goes, you know, you got to think about it. There's only 34 quarterbacks that have won a Super Bowl in all the years and you know how hard is it to be a quarterback you know because that's how the quarterbacks are judged but think of it as teams and and how hard it is and you look at Philadelphia and it's no knock on them they got the number one seed but 
they go in and play a, a they, because of their seeding, and they had a great regular season. They play the Giants, who were kind of an overachiever. Then they play the 49ers in a championship game, and they lose both their quarterbacks. I mean, now they're in the Super Bowl. So luck, yeah. luck sometimes helps. <laughs> yeah, it, it's true. So, but uh, but no, I I just uh, I, I I just wanted to, you know to wrap it up. I just appreciate you taking the time. You've been like I said, even though I haven't I haven't you know wasn't able to see you with my own eyes. You know, when born till seventy five. I have an appreciation for your career and what you've meant to the Dallas Cowboys. And it's one of the things I try and do on, on my show is, is get former players. I love hearing the players that paved the way, the stories that paved the way for the players today, because I think you guys are the most unappreciated, you know, athletes in the NFL. And I've, I've you know, I've talked to Doug Cosby and Larry Cole and like some of the, the fights that you guys have all done to make the NFL what it is today with the strikes and with all of that kind of stuff and the sacrifices and for free agency and for the, these guys to make, you know, the, the money they're making today. It's kind of disappointing to see the NFL, you know, and again, I could be wrong, but from what players have said and, and what I've read kind of not treat the, 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 the players that paved that way with kind of the respect and, and, and appreciation that they deserve. So I always love getting you guys on to hear your stories and yeah. find out well, about you. Thank you so much for having me. I, I enjoy looking back, uh, you know, on, on the years that I played and, and it's, it's, kind of, it's fun to yeah. talk about it. Sometimes, sometimes I, I see, still see Cliff Harris. Uh, he and I do a lot of things together. Uh, and he came in as a free agent, and so he uh, he ended up being in the Hall of Fame, which is pretty good for a free agent. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And and I think is um is uh is Chuck Halley. Chuck Halley should be in. He's year. in. He's in the Hall of oh, Fame. Oh, he's in, Yeah, he got in in the two thousand. I thought there was another player that that was on the list this year. That you know, the one that surprises me, and and you've played with him, so you can tell me. I'm just really surprised Ed Too Tall Jones um, is yeah. in the Hall of Fame, and and really, he's not even in the Ring of Honor uh, for the yeah. Cowboys, which was really surprising to me. Yeah, Ed. Uh... Fortunately for him, that he was playing next to people like Randy, like Randy White and Larry Cole. Yeah, uh, Ed Ed got a lot of one on one blocking because they couldn't double team him and double team Randy White and double team uh, Thomas Henderson on the other side. So uh, Ed was, I mean, he was. <laughs> he was huge. <laughs> Yeah, I saw a picture of, of him in the paper one one time, and it was the cameraman was slaying on the ground, and the angle of the uh, of the camera was going up. So the the, the uh, quarterback was a big figure there, and then uh, the the picture was taken just when he was getting ready to throw the ball, and then Ed Jones' hands were up, and I, I couldn't even see down the field because he was behind the quarterback and it just blocked his view of what was going on because he was so large. I mean, he was, what, six foot seven or something six, like that? Yeah, he, he was huge. And he, he wasn't too tall. He was he was just tall enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I have, he, a, he, I have a picture, uh, a Sports Illustrated of him yeah. and, and Refrigerator Perry standing next to each other when I guess they were playing in London to promote, you know, playing in London. And Refrigerator Perry was a big, yeah, he's a big defensive tackle. And Ed Tutal Jones just makes him look like, you know, just an average guy. Uh, he was just so he was just so big and 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 just an, I, I, he was another you know iconic player in the Cowboys. Like you said, there's just so many. I mean, you could argue. So many. You, you could argue, you know, why, you know, you in the Hall of Fame, Harvey Martin and all of it, Ed Tutal Jones. I mean, Larry Cole, people, you know, I had a great conversation with Larry. Larry Cole played three decades in three decades. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's in the 60s, 70s. I mean, it's amazing. A lot of unsung heroes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, don't get too much attention. No. But like Larry Cole, poor Larry. He was in there next to Randy White. He played with Bob Lilly, George Andre. Ed Tutal, Harvey Martin, 
those are just names that you don't have to be a Cowboys fan to know those names. Yeah. They're just big players. Yeah. Yeah. Such a great, such a great era. And yeah, uh, thank you, Mike. No, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mr. Waters, for coming on and, and sharing sure. some stories. It was a it was a it was truly an honor. And I wish you, your family, you know, all the best. Hopefully, you know, everything is is going well and you're keeping up with the Cowboys and enjoying retirement and you know, having a, <laughs> having, a having a nice time. Enjoy yourself. But I appreciate you coming into okay. the cave and thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thanks right. for having me. All righty. Take care. All right, that was the interview with Cowboys legend, Mr. Charlie Waters, two-time Super Bowl champion, and just the stories. I mean, I could have talked to him for two hours, but, you know, you know how it goes. You only got so much time, and and, and uh, you try and get to so much in a career, you know, his 12-year career, like I said, three Pro Bowls, all pro. I mean, if you haven't looked it up, just look up at that safety tandem between him and Cliff Harris. I mean, it was it was something. And like he said, I mean, undrafted free agent. You know, Charlie Waters was a third round draft pick, but he was a quarterback and receiver in college. They converted him to cornerback, and then they made the, he made the transition to safety. You know, a few years into his career, and then it just skyrocketed. But just so many big plays, and uh, it's always great listening to the stories. Uh, of the guys again that, that 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 paved the way to the players and really the franchise. I know you guys been 27 years. I've had to hear it for, uh, uh, one more time. I'm gonna go crazy, but we were seeing you know, some of these guys were spoiled. I was a little spoiled in the 90s. You know the people in the you know the older fans too in the 70s they were really spoiled. You know the, my son's generation lives in misery because they haven't gotten the Super Bowl. But I think this team is close. So just uh, don't give up on them. I think what happened this year is going to be one of those that 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 elevate them because they're they're right there and you're seeing some of the changes and we're going to talk you know we always talk a lot about it on our shows so make sure you tune in live Monday with my man Jimmy D we talk a lot of sports it's not just Cowboys it's mostly all sports and then Kelly K9 and I you know we hit it up all Cowboys style live on Thursday nights great interviews just recently did an interview with two-time Super Bowl champion Brad Johnson. If you missed that, check it out. There's a there's a playlist uh, that you'll see. I think it's Beyond the Star on on YouTube, and you'll see all the player interviews. And I'm just telling you, it listen to these stories and listen to the the journey that some of these guys had and the accomplishments. Uh, it is just something that that I love it. I love it. I don't know if you guys do, but I love it. And if you do love it, make sure you like, make sure you subscribe because we've got so much going on. And like I always say, man, we're, we're, we are just getting this party started. So I appreciate the support. You guys have a great one, and I will see you on the next one. Peace out. We're going to handle that business. We got to get hyped. Can you feel me? Now, can you dig it?